Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Thies. I'm the founder of IT Leaders. You are at the sixth installment of IT Leaders Louisville. We are bi-monthly this year. That means every two months, in case I always got semi-monthly and bi-monthly confused. But uh, we are gonna, we're, we've gone to every two months here locally, so it's a little more frequent than we were last year. I think it's a little bit easier to remember. We are always the second Tuesday of, the, of every other month, so starting in February. So if you wanna mark those on your calendar, you can. We do have dates set for the rest of the year. Why are we here? Who is this group? What, what is it for? This group is for staff IT directors and managers. That's what it was founded for. People who have often been promoted from individual contributors to leaders with zero training. And uh, we are focused on those leadership skills, on the people skills that make you an effective leader. It's hard to do the people side. Most people find the technology side to be far easier than the people side. So the format of the meeting is breakfast and networking and hearing two guest speakers talk about leadership and their journeys so that you can maybe uh, find some insights on how they're operating on this. So breakfast is in the back. We have replenished the um, caffeinated coffee. And um, there's food and a couple of other drinks there as well. Please take a couple of photos. If you like what you're doing here and you tend to be active on LinkedIn, please take a couple of photos of the speakers and of the crowd so you can help your network understand that this meeting exists. We've got a lovely crowd today. I'm just so happy to see so many people here. Um, make sure that you talk to your friends in IT at work at, and at church and on the soccer field so that uh, we can spread the word about this and so we can grow this group even further. Um, there are three simple ways to stay informed about this group. The website, itleaders.org slash Louisville. I run three of these events. I run one in Indy, I run one in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I run the Louisville event down here. Um, those URLs are, you know, they match up itleaders.org slash city. We do a couple of curriculum-based events in a couple of other markets, more of a um, college-based <coughs> leadership curriculum. This is more of a community, so that's why you're here. Um, there is also a LinkedIn company page called IT Leaders Louisville. You can follow that if you want to see what's happening and what's upcoming. It's a good way to get reminded of upcoming events. And then we run a private LinkedIn group called IT Leaders Community, which uh, includes all the folks from the Fort Wayne and the Indianapolis events as well. And it's a way for you to communicate with each other. So if you want to know about a particular vendor or you want to ask what technology are you using, or you, wanna, um, you want some advice on how to deal with the problem employees that none of you have, that, that's an area that you can have some free talk. We limit the membership of that. There's no service providers in that other than me. So um, you can talk freely in that. Great. Um, we like cross-promoting events. And Shannon Fear was supposed to be here today, but I think she got um, caught up she runs a group called Rocket Women in Louisville. Anybody familiar with Rocket Women? Fabulous, they're a great group. I'm, I'm a big fan of theirs, and men are invited to their events too, or at least to most of their events. Um, she just, I think she's got an event coming up again this month. I would encourage you to take a look at her website and see all the good that she's doing. I know that there's some sponsors in here of Rocket Women, but she runs a great event. Really quick. Yeah, the please. annual Rocket Women Conference is actually coming up in a few weeks, the second week of March. So get your tickets. They're that's right. Sale, so yeah, yeah. Just a quick plug. So yeah, that's a big event. That's yeah. the year. That's the annual event. Yeah. Their biggest event of the year. Yeah. So that's a good one. Great presentation. 
Uh, Louisville Microsoft Users Group, super active Microsoft Users Group here in town. Duran, do you want to speak about that? Sure thing. Good morning, everybody. My name is Duran. I'm with Mirazon. And first, let me thank the, uh, or congratulate the Taylor Swift fans for your Super Bowl win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luma, Louisville Microsoft Users Group, is uh, every month. It's an opportunity for you to come network with local professionals to learn about different types of technology. Uh, this month, we'll be talking about the magic of Microsoft 365. To sign up, you can head over to lumug.org. And uh, this event is going to be on the 23rd at 1130. You can also scan that QR code to get more details. We have another event coming up that Doug's actually excited about. Uh, it is called the Control-Alt-Compete event. It's an opportunity for you to come and show off your IT acronym trivia knowledge. So, <laughs> yeah, me, I don't know what either, but <laughs> the, uh, it's going to be at Bruce Chris Steakhouse, Thursday, March the 14th, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Again, QR code on the slide if you want to scan that and get more event details. So this event is a basically a happy hour for the IT leaders group that Mirazon put on. We did a happy hour last year um, at a cool little speakeasy downtown. So this event is for you, and uh, I don't know about how you feel about competition. I tend to find IT people fairly competitive. You know, winning's not important to me, it's beating everyone else. So this, <laughs> this is a real opportunity to show your skills on PLAs, on those three-letter acronyms that uh, are so common in IT. I hope to see every single one of you there. And I think there's some team, it's team oriented too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, two to three people on the team, so. Yeah, I, uh, I'm excited about this event. I've never done anything like this before. I think it's super cool. Uh, a couple of other groups we've had attendees from, the Louisville Data Technology Group. Are you folks from Brown Foreman involved in that? So I actually run that. Oh, please, speak about it. Uh, so I'm Josh Ingemoff, I'm with Centric Consulting. Uh, so the Louisville Data Technology Group meets every second Thursday of the month. Uh, we typically meet at Tech Systems. Um, we do have an event coming up April 12th and 13th. Great. Uh, it's a full day, like eight hour training block on Friday. And then on that Saturday, it's free training other than maybe lunch. Um, we've got the lineup that we'll post probably in the next two weeks. Who, who are good candidates for your event? Uh, anybody from individual contributors. It's mainly data focused, but we'll do some app dev all the way up into executive leadership. We try to have a good spread both, one, you know, 100 level, all the way to 400. Thanks, Josh. Really appreciate it. Okay, and I'm actually going to be doing a webinar um, February 21 on clouds, which cloud is right for your organization. Um, I talk a lot on IT strategy when I'm not talking about leadership, so if this is of interest to you, that's the link. If, uh, if you want to ask about it, if you don't have time to hit, you know, snap the picture of this link, I'd be happy to talk about it as well. Um, we videotape all these events. Our videographer, Eric Feggi, has been fabulous in taking care of these. These are located out on Expedient's YouTube channel, my employer's YouTube channel. We've got events from the last couple of years out there, end to end, you know, start to finish the events. They run about an hour and 15 minutes, so you can get content from all the events. In addition to that, we started breaking these up into audio-only podcasts. So today's talks by Ryan Brubaker and by Elias will be broken up into their 30-minute segments for audio. This is the link to get to um, the podcast aggregator of your choice, or if you just search IT leaders in your favorite podcast app, then you can find this information. Great way to catch the content without um, necessarily having to pay full attention to it in the car or something like that. Um, this is your part of the meeting. This is where you can talk about any open positions you have in your organization, or if you're in transition, um, if you're in transition quietly, you may want to not want to talk about that. But um, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for you. First of all, first of all, does anyone in their organization have open positions right now that they want to speak up about? Durant. I don't think I said my company name. <laughs> We're with a company called Mirazon. Uh, we are the region's premier provider of techni technology services. We have been in business since 2000, and our core purpose is an unwavering commitment to delivering exceptional service. We've got multiple positions over, so head over to mirazon.com forward slash careers 
We have a systems engineer position that will be working for me. We have a project manager position that will also be working for my team. And I think we have a virtualization engineer coming up as well. So three openings, a uh, good company to be with. I've been there for 17 years, so it's obviously a good place to work. Or is it that they're dumb enough not to fire me? I don't know, but <laughs> it's a great company. Uh, and I'd love to see you there. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Anyone else? Anyone else with open positions? Please. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Boucher. I'm at uh, El Foro. Uh, you can see the bull down here at Spaghetti Junction. Uh, we're an ad tech company. I've been there since September. Really, really love the culture there. We're hiring for uh, DevOps engineers and a uh, DevOps manager. Nice. DevOps. The uh, combination between infrastructure and development. It's like church and state mixed up, isn't it? <laughs> Elias. <laughs> So, Elias Sox and I are here at Young Brands, and you guys know what we all do. Uh, I currently have open an IT senior manager GRC role, right? So that's everything you think about, IT risk, vendor risk, policies and standards, security awareness, those kind of things. So if you know anyone that's looking, that was just posted yesterday, so. Timing. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else have open roles in their org that they want to speak up about? All right, now, anybody who's looking for their next role? Please. Uh, Doug Lane. Uh, was, uh, la last uh, role was uh, Director of Infrastructure and Engineering at Align Technology. Um, I've got over two decades of leadership experience, uh, DevOps, SRE, uh, Cloud Engineering, uh, Developer Experience, uh, and observability as well. So, um, yeah, um, looking around uh, local as well as uh, remote uh, because uh, just there's not a lot of roles uh, out there uh, at this time. Beginning of the years. Both well, the economy and everything. But engineering role is that what you're looking that's for? That's what I'm looking for, the engineering role, uh, whether it's manager, senior manager, director, okay. and so on. Uh, I'm not really concerned about title so much as. Um, Leading a team and helping that team develop and contribute to the company. Thanks, Doug. Anybody else? Okay, fabulous. Um, how can you help this group? As I mentioned, uh, talk about us on at church or on the soccer field. Make sure you pick the right time on both of those, <laughs> or with your colleagues. Um, and you'll probably be hearing from me in the next few days. I really value the feedback as. Uh, audience members and participants. It's important for us to understand what you like and what you dislike about the meeting. So um, take a call from me uh, sometime in the near future so we can make sure that we stay aligned. Uh, here is the calendar. I'll give you a couple of seconds if you want to take a picture of this. This is at itleaders.org slash Louisville. Uh, you can find this, th these dates. Naturally, today is February 13th. These are all the second Tuesdays of every other month. There's a good chance that the December event will be more of a happy hour type event, not in the morning. Shouldn't do a happy hour in the morning. Um, and we'll probably be out in the, uh, out in the community somewhere, but uh, Yum has been really kind, and big thanks to Yum for supporting this event and hosting us. Um, so we'll be, we'll be at, uh, in this facility, not necessarily in this room, but in this facility, uh, because of their generous support. Uh, the next event is April 9th, and we have one of our two speakers. Uh, Shane Rodebaugh is going to be speaking on um, authentic authenticity. I think that's good. That's a good one, especially as a leader. And then Laura Mattingly uh, will be speaking about building rapport um, with your team and with the other sides of the business. Uh, I'm really looking forward to both of these topics. These are both skills that leaders need, and we need to teach our direct reports. So two great topics. Um, finally, I want to express gratitude to Centric Consulting. We have a few Centric team members here, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they do great work um, across a variety of disciplines. Dion, what are your disciplines that you talk about? <laughs> Well, we have 63. Let me start with number one. <laughs> yeah, we do a variety of business and technology services, mostly in the technology space, I would say. Um, Microsoft stack, Salesforce stack, uh, Oracle stack, and everything from IT strategy to custom app development. So I'd say that, that pretty much covers it.
Christian, you're the face of Centric here locally, right? Um, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, without Centric, this group would not have grown to the size that it is today. The fact that they're here local and supporting us and getting the word out has been huge for us. We're big fans of Centric. We work with them in multiple markets. So uh, I would encourage you to get to know them and understand the services that they provide. And then my uh, employer is Expedient. We are a data center company. We're actually 15 data centers right now in 10 cities. We just uh, picked one up last week. And we are one of the biggest VMware clouds in town. We do a variety of services. We are actively shopping for a corporate data center here in Louisville. We've got one um, that conversations are advanced with, but it's not done yet. So. If uh, you've got a data center or if you know of one where the uh, company would like to monetize it but doesn't want to move out, would like to become the anchor tenant, we'd love to talk to you about that. I've got to give Expedient a lot of credit because they allow me to spend my time and their money putting these events on. And it's very rare for service providers to bring value to a community with no expectation of anything in return. So um, we're the kind of vendor that you want to deal with in my opinion, thanks to Expedient. And then finally, today's speakers. We're gonna start with Ryan Brubaker. He's a friend of mine from the indie market. He uh, gave a version of this talk a few months ago and I thought it was super important. Uh, he's gonna be talking about stress management and then Elias Oxendine from here at Yum will be talking about thriving in the tech tornado. So, Ryan, here's the clicker. Let me do the AV work here. All right, good morning. Thanks for your time this morning. Uh, I'm Ryan Brubaker. Uh, it's great to be with you. This is going to be one of the more touchy-feely IT presentations you've seen. I hope you were prepared, and I hope you enjoy it. This is what I really want to talk about. Have you ever been here? Have you ever been laying in bed? It's 2 a.m., can't get back to sleep, freaked out because of some project the next day, something that's about to happen, uh, some network outage, or maybe there's nothing going wrong and you're just worried about what could go wrong. That's what I'm here to talk about this morning. And I've got some exercises for you to try. This is me, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Seaspring. We're a data and AI consulting company based in Indianapolis. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about me. Uh, I've been a CIO of over 15 years and Purdue, IU, I'll, you can read that. But anyway, that's me, I'm Ryan. Just another human, just like all the other humans in this room. Correct. Unless some of you are AI, in which case, please, <laughs> please don't divulge that. Anyway, back to this. Uh, what keeps you up at night? What makes you worried? And how do you deal with it? How do you process the fact that you're laying in bed at night, can't get back to sleep? What do you think about? Do you count sheep? Do you, um, I, re I read one study that said that actually if you really think really hard about falling back asleep, it actually helps. They say they tend to distract yourself. But then this study said, no, actually, you should sit there and just think really hard about falling back asleep. Kind of an interesting study. So what do you do? I, I brought three, three ideas. So here's the agenda. First is I'm gonna try to establish that there really is a problem. I think you're all gonna agree with me, but it's, <laughs> it'll still be fun to establish it, right? And then I'm going to talk about an exercise called the worst case scenario, another exercise called the overlook, and then the last exercise that I'll cover is called the Superman. Okay, I don't know if you guys have heard those, but we'll jump right in. So the problem. Have you ever seen these memes, expectation versus reality? I really think they're funny. Uh, you know, there's the expectation of, of motherhood, I guess, and then the reality of being kicked in the face while you're sleeping. Uh, travel expectations, I'm gonna go see the Great Wall of China, and then it turns out there's you know thousands of other people standing there with you, and that takes away from some of it. Uh, first day of school, definitely different than expected. Uh, my snowman always looked like the one on the right. I don't know about you. I never could make a good snowman growing up. Uh, so there's the expectation, the reality. And then, of course, there's your plan, and then there's the reality on how you're going to accomplish your plan. So I thought it'd be fun based on that. I thought, you know what? I'm going to make some written job descriptions versus actual job descriptions, kind of a play on the expectations versus reality. So let's start with a written job description for a cashier. Just write grocery and seeking a cashier who will smile and greet customers, scan their items, collect payment. Sounds pretty simple, but of course the actual job description is get yelled at by customers because there aren't enough lanes open. They're upset because there aren't more employees on staff, and customers are upset because you won't process coupons that don't actually apply to their order. 
My daughter was a cashier, and this is what she dealt with all day, every day. There's the actual job description, right? This next one is fun. I have a friend who's an optometrist, so I got this from him. The uh, Acme Optometry seeks the optometrist who will heal the blind, help small children who are failing in school. That's what you sign up for to be an optometrist. In reality, your job is one or two. <laughs> that's what you do all day, every day. Uh, that's what my friend tells me. That's all he does all day, every day, after thinking he was going to heal the blind and help children who were failing in school. OK, student. Purdue University is seeking students who want to learn amazing things, party all night, and then receive daily Venmo payments from their parents so you can have a great lifestyle. Right? That's what they say on the tour, on the campus tour, before the check is written. And then once the check is written, you show up as a student, and you have 7.30 classes, hangovers, back-to-back -back classes on the other side of campus, finals week, your parents aren't giving you any money because you have a C in one of your classes, and then of course there's the nightmares. I don't know if you all still have the nightmare that I have that you show up to finals week and you realize that you hadn't attended the entire class the whole semester. Uh, we all have those kinds of like school nightmares, I think. And that's the actual job description for students. So let's get into the written job description for IT leader. You know where I'm going with this, so feel free to laugh as hard as you would like. <laughs> ABC Company is seeking a strategic thinker that will act with full autonomy to lead the company into a new digital age, right? They're looking for an IT leader that will sit at the executive table and drive revenue by utilizing the cutting edge of technology. That sounds like the written job description, doesn't it? How about a team player who will be supported by all their colleagues and trusted to protect the company from unnecessary operational costs and cybersecurity threats? That definitely feels like the advertised IT leader job description, doesn't it? Let's talk about the actual <coughs> job description of an IT leader. How about this one? We're going to implement Agile only to be told that the only reason you're implementing Agile is because IT doesn't want to give out any dates, they don't want to commit to anything, they don't want to have any milestones anymore, and what is this Kanban business? So you just make a list and then you just work in order and you don't commit to anything? Or when it needs to be done? That's stressful. Or how about this? We want a five-year roadmap, and you work for months to build a five-year roadmap to get buy-in from everybody, and then 15 minutes after the roadmap gets approved, you're told, we're changing direction, we have a new rally cry, we need you to change everything about what you're gonna deliver for the rest of this year. And then, of course, a year later, when you go through all the list of all the stuff you delivered, somebody stands up and holds the roadmap and dusts it off <laughs> and says, why aren't we right here where you said a year ago we would be? And you have to defend yourself, right? Even though you documented all the change requests and you put it all in writing and, and you invited people to stakeholder meetings and everybody was bought in on the fact that you were gonna change everything, but of course, now it's a year has gone by and everybody has selective memory and they just pull out the old, the old roadmap that you produced a year ago and want to know why you're not where you said you'd be. How about tabletop DR exercises? Where you're sitting there taking made up scenarios, walking through everything you are going to do, and of course this is really good and healthy and I hope your organization does tabletop DR exercises. But in the back of your mind as the leader, you're thinking, is this even the scenario we're, we're gonna face? And if this is the scenario we're gonna face, is this even going to, any of this even gonna work? I mean, we're just sitting here talking. Of course, in theory, we can say we would do this, and we would find root cause, and then we'd call this vendor, and then we would do that. That's great to think about, but you know, you're laying in bed at night thinking about that DR exercise we did today. Was that even of any value? Is it gonna be anything like that? How about the do not disturb settings on your phone? You go in, you put your phone on do not disturb, and then you immediately set everybody you know to break through do not disturb. Because what if your team needs to get a hold of you? What if your boss needs to get a hold of you? What if your colleague needs to get a hold of you? What if one of your vendors needs to get a hold of you? So now you're setting all these breakthroughs, so you practically have no point in turning on do not disturb. Not to mention that you've got pager duty and all your alerting apps and all that stuff turned on so that it can wake you up in the middle of the night, right? That's the life of an IT leader. Oh, how many of you have done this? I've done this many times in my career where you have two Zoom calls going at once. You're in the middle of an incident, you've got one Zoom call with the war room, you've got the other Zoom call, which is the executive briefing. And you've got the executive executives asking you, hey, is this resolved yet? And then you get on the team with your war room, on with your war room, and, and you're saying, is this resolved yet? And they're saying, we don't even have root cause yet. Like, what, what do you mean, is this resolved yet? So you go back to the executive, you mute, unmute, you go back to the executive briefing. Well, can we at least get a worker in place? So you mute them and you go back to the board. Can we at least get a worker around the place? And they're like, boss, we don't even have the root cause yet. How could we have a worker out of place? 
I've been on a few of those in the middle of the night where I have two Zoom calls going at once. It's very fun playing back and forth. <coughs> then, of course, if you do have some kind of an incident or a breach, well, the board wants accountability. And unfortunately, most people view accountability or define accountability as just firing someone, right? So maybe <coughs> that's you. Maybe you're the person at the top, you're the person in charge of that, and it's, you're the one who's selected to be the person who is held accountable so that the board can do a, a press release and start uh, doing damage control. There's an excellent book, The Wolf and CIO's Closing, that really kind of changed how I thought about a lot of things. And it's, um, I'm, I fashion myself as a servant leader. I'm not Machiavellian. I don't believe that you should necessarily follow Machiavellian principles in how you lead an IT group. But it's a great book to just really challenge your thinking and, and make you consider and pause. And Tina tells a story in this book about how IT leaders are typically data people. They like lots of numbers, they like lots of data, they're data driven, they think in data. And so a critical mistake that many IT leaders make is they assume that everybody would like the data and they're overly transparent. And I actually have suffered from this for a lot of my career and, and changed some of my philosophy and strategy based on this book. But she tells a great story. She talks about all, of all the CIOs that she's interviewed and worked with. She's a Gartner, uh, a Gartner leader. And of all the CIOs that she's worked with and talked with, not one of them has ever shared a whole bunch of data and had it go well. And, and I'll give you an example. I, I did that. Well, a CFO of mine was asking about velocity and sprint planning and how we were doing everything. So I said, great. Why don't you come to a retro? Why don't you come to a sprint planning session? You can come to some daily stand-up. I'll share my DevOps with you. You can see my Kanban board. You can see everything. You can, uh, you, uh, we, uh, I guess this was a Scrum team. So you can see my Scrum planning. You can see my Sprint planning. And just open it all up. Because I thought, that's great, right? That's what you should do as a transparent leader. You just share all the data. And of course, uh, the person didn't come back and say, oh, I totally understand now. You're running a fantastic organization. I totally trust you. I'll never question you again, Ryan, no. Of course, they said, hey, I went back through the data last night and I found you know, seven sprints ago, you didn't nearly hit the velocity that you had been hitting. And I don't remember you like sharing that with the executive team. And so it was, you know, it, it's, it's classic. And she shares this in the book. She says, nobody ever comes back and says that really went well. And the transparency was appreciated. So just a really, really interesting read. So I guess my point is, I think this is the IT leader job description. A picture for the thousand words. Right? This is your job description. This is just sit there and work to wonder what's gonna happen tomorrow, to wonder what event is gonna transpire. Is the tabletop exercise gonna even work? Stress is physical, mental, or emotional strain or tension. Worry over his job and his wife's health put him under great stress. Well, that, that mentions worry. Let's define worry. To torment oneself with or suffer from disturbing thoughts. To fret, to torment with cares, anxieties, etc. Anxiety is distress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear or danger or mis fear of danger or misfortune. She felt anxiety about the possible loss of her job. So that's a theme in all of these examples that the dictionary gives. How about fear? A distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc. Whether the threat is real or imagined, the feeling or condition of being afraid. And isn't that interesting? Whether real or imagined. Whether the things that you're worried about are real or imagined, you're still laying there in bed at night, aren't you? You're still looking at the clock saying it's 2 a.m. Like, can I go back to sleep? Got that big thing due to today. <clears throat> a quick word about grief and depression. I'm not covering grief or depression. I'm not a licensed therapist or psychiatrist. That's not my point this morning, is not to cover those things. If you suffer from those things, those are very real. If you've had a loss, if you've, uh, if you've experienced depression, you should absolutely see uh, professional assistance. Uh, but I'm here to just kind of encourage you with some of the daily stresses of life is my goal. So here's a rhetorical question. Are people more or less anxious than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago? I mean, everybody knows all the studies. People are, are so much more stressed and anxious than they used to be. So there you have it. Have, have I convinced you there's a problem? Everybody on board? Okay, let's talk about three exercises that might be able to help. <coughs> The first one's called the worst case scenario. Before I jump into this, I want to ask you a question related to this exercise. What's your identity? If I ask you that question, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
Think about it. What is your identity? At your very core, who are you? Didn't think we were going to get so existential this morning, did we? <laughs> this is fun. Okay, what's your identity? Well, is it, is it this? Is this my identity? Is it just a bunch of stuff? Oh, yeah, executive leader, CIO, got these degrees. Is that, is that, I mean, some people view that as their identity. How about this one? Your LinkedIn profile. Is your LinkedIn profile your identity? I think we all struggle at times with, with wrapping up our identity in just our work or what, what we bring to the table every day, don't we? How about at your inner core, what are your personal core values? These are mine. I don't know if you've ever sat down and thought about what your personal core values are, because that's really who you are. That's really your identity, is your personal core values. I would highly encourage you to sit down sometime and write out your personal core values, because that will help you with this worst case scenario exercise. But let's keep going. So if I ask you what's your identity, really at the core it gets to, when I mentioned core values, core values is what makes you valuable. Are you valuable? So let's define that. Valuable is having considerable monetary worth costing or bringing a high price. Having qualities worthy of respect, admiration, or esteem, and of consider or of considerable use, service, or importance. <clears throat> I would argue this morning that every single person sitting here is extremely valuable. You are worth so much. You have qualities of respect that are worthy of respect, admiration, and esteem, and you are of considerable use, service, or importance. You know you are. At your core, you know you're valuable. Even when your inner critic accuses you that you're not. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what gets in the way? I think there's two things, imposter syndrome and anxious thinking. What's imposter syndrome? Feeling that you're on the verge of being exposed as a fraud. Isn't that interesting? is extremely common in high achieving individuals and it affects both men and women equally. It's been studied quite a bit over the last 20 years, this concept of imposter syndrome. It's actually the CEO's biggest fear. If you, if you survey CEOs high, above death, I mean death was actually on the list and it was lower than imposter syndrome, being found out that they're gonna walk into work one day and be told by the board of directors, we figured you out, you're a total fraud, you have no idea what you're doing, pack up your stuff. <clears throat> That's CEO's uh, biggest fear when surveyed, is, it, is it this imposter syndrome that they're gonna be found out. Okay, now you couple that with anxious thinking. What are some of the things that you're afraid of? I could lose my job. My job isn't prestigious enough. I don't make enough money. I'm failing myself and my family. I don't volunteer or help others enough. Those are the anxious thinking that creeps in that are keeping you up at night? And which ones resonate with you the most? Okay, so with that as our foundation, here's the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario, probably everybody knows what I'm talking about on this one, is the idea of just sitting down and thinking through if those fears come true, if whatever that thing is that I'm freaked out about, if it really does come true, what really happens? Because our brains tend to go to a much greater worst case scenario than is reality. For me, one of the things that I really worried about all the time was losing my job. I was convinced, subconsciously, I was convinced that if I lost my job, within a few days, this would be me. I would be out, I would have nothing. And I read a book where a guy even talked about, he did couch counting. And what he would do is he would count the number of couches of friends that would let him sleep on their couch if the worst happened and he like lost his home. And he said, I would count couches, all my friends from uh, work, uh, school, church, whatever, and I would just literally count the couches and I would say, yeah, I've got 20 couches or 18 couches that I can sleep on, and that would help him feel better. He would think through, you know, so the worst case scenario is I'm, I'm on one of those 18 couches, right? I guess if you ever can't count to one couch, then you're in trouble. You don't have anybody that you can sleep on their couch. But the reality is you work through this worst case scenario, and what ultimately comes out is you're probably not going to end up on the street begging for food. Pretty unlikely. So that's the worst case scenario, is just think through, thinking through that and actually playing out what is that fear? Is it a fear of a job loss? Is it a fear of a relationship that gets uh, harmed, uh, a personal relationship or something like that? And so the worst case scenario takeaways are this. Where do you struggle with imposter syndrome or anxious thinking? And then take time today with someone you trust to honestly work out the worst case scenario of that fear.
with me? You know, think that might make you feel better? Maybe? Worth a try? Okay, that's exercise one. The second exercise we're gonna talk about is the overlook. Have you ever had one of these experiences where you're out hiking or you're maybe at like the, um, a national monument or something like that and you just walk up to an overlook and it just gives you such a grandiose view that you realize it just puts life in perspective. It's like, it's like you have this out of body experience where you just realize there's so much more to life and it gives you a really a good perspective. So that's, that's what the goal of the overlook is. And the best way I think to get that perspective is to talk about what your regrets might be in your final moments. So a, re a study was done of what people, what people's biggest regrets are in their final moments and they compiled them and they came up with the 15, basically 15 themes, categories, of course they got hundreds of answers but they distilled it into, you know, what did it really boil down to was these 15. So I'm gonna walk you through these 15 quickly I have them all written down, and so you don't, don't feel like you need to take pictures of every one of these slides or write them down if you don't want, because I have a handout for you to take with you today if you want it that has all these on it. So let's start with number one. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. <laughs> Very unsurprisingly. Does anybody on their deathbed say, I wish I had just worked harder and spent less time with my family? Nobody says that. So that's, that's a pretty straightforward one. And I, as I go through each of these, I want you to think about, like, how likely is this one for me? Because some of them won't resonate at all, and you're going to say, ah, I'm not going to worry about that at all. That's not going to be a regret of mine at all. But some of them might hit really home. How about number two? I wish I had laughed things off more often. That's something I struggle with. I take certain things personally, and I need to just say, oh, well, we're all humans. We all make mistakes. We all say things that aren't nice or whatever and just move on. But that's actually the number two regret. I wish I had laughed things off more often. How about number three, I wish I had enjoyed more of the foods I loved. That's a funny one, isn't it? It's kind of interesting, but it kind of makes sense. My dad has told me, son, I've worked all my life on my way. I've watched what I've eaten. I've done everything I can to keep my weight down and, and eaten healthy. And so he literally told me, the day I go into hospice someday, I want you to only feed me pie. <laughs> I know he's kind of half kidding, but like, I get it. Like, I don't know. I, all I want to eat is donuts once I'm in hospice. Like, let me enjoy it on my way out. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a big regret. Number three, I wish I enjoyed more of the foods I loved. How about number four? I wish I hadn't wasted time trying so hard for people that didn't matter. Wow, that's like an arrow straight through my heart. I mean, there are people that I was trying to impress 20 years ago that I haven't seen in 20 years, and they probably don't even remember me. And yet I, I spent my effort trying to impress them or make them happy or please them. Wow, I'm not surprised that that's a common one. That hits home for me. How about this? I wish I had not been so attached to my phone. There's some great books on this one. Uh, At Your Best is a great book. There's another great book I read a couple years ago called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book mm -hmm. on how hurried our lives are and how, how much we need to slow down, and that includes setting down our phone. I wish I had taken more risks, lived a little more on the edge. Maybe you wish you had been that entrepreneur or just made, or maybe jumped out of an airplane, right, and, and then done some skydiving, I don't, whatever it might be. This is a common one. I wish I had stood up to the bullies, the meanies, the baddies, and the gossips. <laughs> this really surprised me. This made it into their research that people actually regretted that they hadn't stood up to the people who were gossiping, who were bullying. Like we've all seen it happen and we just kind of walk away. And maybe in the moment that is the right thing to do, but there are also times where the right thing to do is to stand up and say, you know what? This isn't how humans should be treating each other. This is a big one. I wish I had made a difference kind of unexpected there. Everybody probably has regrets about that they could have volunteered more or done something more for a greater impact. Number nine, I wish I hadn't spent so much time worrying about things I couldn't control. Wow, that takes you right back to the alarm clock picture. Right? You don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring and yet there you are, pre-worried pre about it, pre-processing. How many times have you spent hours worrying about something and then that thing never even came true? Sometimes it does, but why not only worry about it when it does come true? Why do, you, why do we worry about it when it's not gonna come true? I have entire conversations with myself. My wife walks into my office and says, you 
talking to yourself again? Because I'm literally talking to the person about the conversation I think I'm going to have tomorrow with them. Why am I doing that? Why am I pre-planning how I think that conversation is going to go? We spend a lot of time on that, and, and it's a regret for people in their final moments. Wish I had traveled more. Kind of unexpected to see that on the list. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's going to be you. I wish I had pursued the career I really wanted. Doesn't this give you some perspective? I mean, life's too short. Imagine being in a career that you didn't like or at a job that was terrible for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you needed to just take a risk and go out and get another job, but you didn't do it. That's going to be a regret someday, isn't it? I wish I had taken better care of my health. Now, you might be thinking, hey, that's in contrast to I wish I had eaten all the more of the foods I loved. <laughs> that, those, but actually, in the research, they explain this isn't about eating better. This is about people who very commonly refuse to go to the doctor, they don't get that annual checkup, they don't get on the heart meds soon enough or whatever it is their doctor's telling them to do. Uh, they have that pain that's nagging them that they're afraid of what it could be, so they refuse to go to the doctor and find out what that pain is. That's what this is, it's about health. It's, I wish I had just done the things that I should have done for my health. Yeah, this is number 12. Number 13, I wish I had been more present. That's one of the things I talk to about with all new employees about is being present, including in meetings. Close the laptop unless you're taking notes. Make sure you're taking notes. Uh, don't play on your phone. Don't, if, you're, if you're there, be there for a reason and be present. Number 14, I wish I had seen my own worth. Wow. That's really deep. <laughs> I'm just going to let that sit for a second. <laughs> And then last, I wish I had realized how much I already had. It speaks to contentment, doesn't it? We have a lot of stuff. We have a lot to be thankful for. We are, we are very blessed. And sometimes it just takes a minute to just think about that. So which one stood out to you? I have a survey here. It's a sheet with all 15. And I've got a 1 through 10 underneath each one. And so you can take one of these with you. And you can rate... How likely is it that I'm going to feel this way in my final moments? Some of them will be 10, some of them might be 1s. And then on the far right, there's an opportunity where you can just stack rank them. And I would encourage you to do that. Uh, that's the overlook. Hopefully that gives you some perspective. And so takeaways for this exercise, what's one real world issue causing you anxiety right now? And take at least five minutes today, or alone or out loud with someone you trust, and apply the overlook to this issue. So take that issue that you're freaked out about, that thing that's been keeping you awake at night the last few nights, and then go through those 15 and say, is, am I really have, have the right perspective? Should I really be up at night worrying about this? Or should I have more of the perspective of those 15 final moments? And then take the 15 final moments survey. Like I said, I've got it at my table, so just come grab one on your way out. I've got plenty of them. And what are you going to change immediately because of your highest scoring items? Last time I did this, I, have, I had people email me and say, by doing this scorecard, it put things in perspective for me of thing, changes that I needed to make immediately because of the things that, I was, uh, that, that I'm going to end up regretting. So, because, and so in order to avoid that, I'm going to go make changes immediately. So highly encourage you to look at that. Okay, I got one more. I'm almost done. This is the Superman. Okay, we talked about imposter syndrome. This is kind of the other side of the imposter syndrome coin. That, this is the inner critic. This is that person, that thing, that nagging voice in your head that tells you nothing is good enough. But it's not just like imposter syndrome where you're afraid you're going to be found out. It's all the way down to the way you just signed your name wasn't good enough. The, the conversation you just had with your friend Oh no, I said something I shouldn't have said. This is the inner critic that accuses you of every single thing in your life that your nothing is ever good enough. That's the inner critic. What's the opposite of the inner critic? What's the inner critic attacking you for? Self-regard. Regard or consider consideration for oneself. Self-respect. So let's look up self-respect. Proper esteem or regard for the dignity of one's character. Do you recognize that? That you are a human being and that you have dignity? You have inherent self-worth, and so you should have proper regard for that. That's self-respect. It's not arrogance. It's not a lack of humility. 
It's just self-regard. You're just regarding yourself properly as having the dignity inherent within you. Remember number 14, I wish I had seen my own work. That's, a spe that's speaking to that inner critic. That I wish I had not listened to my inner critic so much throughout my life. Did you know that they have done scientific studies on human body language, and when people are down on themselves, when they're critical of themselves, they close off their body. See how this person is putting their hands at their head? <clears throat> they fold themselves in and they make themselves small. And this is true, it's been studied across all, uh, all geographies, all countries, all cultures. Everybody, everybody that's human is, is exactly this way. This is what they do when they're down on themselves. What do they do when they're happy with themselves? They make themselves big. They cheer, arms go up, body goes out, legs go spread. I mean, it's like they make themselves big. Again, across all cultures, across all geographies, that's what they do. They celebrate, arms go in the air, fists pumped. And so studies have been done on this and found that like with a lot of things in our brain, we can train our brain by mimicking these motions. And uh, Theater trainers and public speaking trainers have been using this technique for years. Because what happens is if you make yourself do this, it will actually change your brain chemistry. It will actually make you feel more emboldened. It will actually increase your self-regard. So it sounds, it looks cheesy, <laughs> but it's really true. In fact, uh, like I said, public speaking trainers and, and, and acting coaches uh, have people do this before they go out on stage. I actually forgot to do this before I came out. <laughs> Probably would have been even better if I had done this. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 uh, people will actually say, go in the bathroom and like stand there and do this for like 30 seconds before you walk out to give a presentation. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much it changes you, and it does. It changes your brain chemistry. If you try <laughs> it, I promise you, you'll agree with me. It really does work. If you're feeling down, and you're just feeling like you're in the dumps, and you're just letting everybody down, or you've just failed, just go in and say, and stand like this for a minute and think about it. It will change, it will change your perspective, it really will. It will change your demeanor and your posture. Okay, so some takeaways. What's one area of your life where you struggle with self-regard? Pick one person to tell about this struggle and write their name down. And then what are you gonna change, do, or think differently now that you've identified this? And go in a private room and practice the Superman for 30 seconds while thinking about that struggle. Okay, so we covered the problem, we covered the worst case scenario, we talked about the overlook, and then we talked about the Superman. I have one final takeaway, and that is, if I seem really touchy-feely and super into all this stuff, I actually am. There are some of us out there. <laughs> and so I really care about you. I really care about each person in this room. I think you are full of dignity and self-worth, and you deserve to not have those 15 regrets at the end of your life. You deserve to go to, go to work every day filled with joy and fun and enthusiasm. You, in, you deserve to have those things. And so I would love to hear your story. So I'm, I'm based in Indianapolis, but I would be happy to meet you somewhere for coffee. I'd be happy to do a video call my contact information is on here, and Doug will send out these slides. Uh, but I would love to just hear your story and talk to you. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Just, I would love to spend 15 minutes or half an hour just hearing a little bit about you, um, or longer. But, so that's just an, uh, just an offer from me. Uh, here's all my footnotes. This is all the stuff that I like could reference. And then here's my contact information. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>
right? So I had a good time, you know, serving Uncle Sam for that time frame. After that, I did a brief stint. I went from cyber and IT, I went into marketing. I went to work for Kraft Foods as a marketer. I was the associate brand manager for Kraft's Cheese Whiz product, right? So my mantra has been, if there's anything in life, I'm not gonna sit on the sidelines and say woulda, coulda, shoulda, I'm gonna try it. Now how in the world I got to Kraft, that's a long story, that's a different conversation, that's probably over half your hour in drinks, I guarantee you, you will laugh your butts off on that one, right? So some of you've heard that. However, after Kraft, I then had the opportunity to come to Louisville, right? And so the marketing job was interesting for me, but it's not what I wanted to do. So I won't say it was a bad experience, but it certainly told me what I did not want to do. Now, I'm originally from Georgia, so I have thin blood, thin skin. That craft role was in Chicago, two <laughs> Chicago winners. I told my wife, look, the next job is IT, preferably cyber, anything south of Chicago, I don't care what it is, we're out of here. And fortunately, GE came calling, and so that's what brought us to Louisville. So been here a total almost 18 years, nine years with GE Appliances, see some of you folks in the room. Uh, I then went to spend time with Brown Foreman leading their uh, global security program, so I am contributing to your depletions, right, <laughs> with, with Jack and Woodford. And then I've been here with Yum for approximately three and a half years, to be four years uh, come, come June, right. So as Doug and I are talking about this topic, he's like, well, I really want to have you come to this group and talk, right? And he's like, well, what do you want to talk about? I was like, hell, I don't know, Doug. I mean, what do you mean? There's so many things we can talk about, right? And so I said, well, what I can tell you is I got a lot of shit going on right now within my job that's stressing me the hell out, right? That I'm trying to figure out how do I navigate and how do I manage this? And from that conversation, we are like, that's it. Thriving in the tech tornado, right? How do you navigate that personal resiliency amidst IT change, right? <laughs> so I know some of you are coming in thinking, hey, Elias, this is great. We've got a packed room. You're coming in like, Elias is going to give us the goods. He's going to give us the holy grail. All these answers and how in the hell are we going to make this, Elias has cracked this code. No, I haven't. <laughs> what I am going to share with you are things that you guys already know. Some of you do today. Some of you will probably start after this session, right? But I'm not going to tell you anything any different. When we talk about that personal, personal resiliency, these are things that you are in control of and can use to actually help you navigate throughout this tech tornado, right? And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. And so Peter Drucker, Ryan, thank you for this. Peter Drucker, in one of his books, talks about stress. So when you're feeling stress in your life, that is life trying to teach you a lesson. It is pushing you a certain direction, saying, hey, you need to learn this lesson. Where most of us fail is we miss the lesson. You don't adhere to it, right? And so, but today, we can talk a little bit about stress, but I'm gonna share with you seven things that will help you, I think, navigate through this tech tornado and maintain your sanity, right? So, I came up with an acronym. There's seven things. It is called CAMP BMC. Now, CAMP is rather easy and straightforward. The BMC piece, hey, I had three letters left. I couldn't get that creative. I told you, I didn't do well in marketing, so you're not going to get a lot from that perspective, right? So I came up with something, seeing, you know, BMC, so it is what it is, right? And so, but I will make uh, this material available with everyone after the fact, right? So you can have it for reference in these things, right? So the first thing, C, start with camp. This is that continuous learning and developing your skills, right? If you think about whatever tornado, whatever situation that you're facing, what got you to your current position today won't get you to where you need to be, right? So one of the things that we all have to continue to do is make sure that we're advancing ourselves by being that continuous learner, right? I, for one, I don't read books. I listen to them, but I don't read them often. My wife gets on me about that, right? So, but I will listen to them, but you gotta have this appetite to wanna go in and continuously learn, right? Now, there are a couple ways in which people can learn. It can be through books, it can be through relationships, it can be through events like this, right? So, but you have to be that continuous learner to make sure you stay sharp and current on what you're trying to work and navigate through. Stay informed on industry trends, right? So, everyone's heard about Gen AI, right? All right, how many of you guys looking at that and planning in that space? A couple of hands, right, okay. How are you learning about it? You're going through various podcasts, blogs, et cetera, and those kind of things, right? So you gotta make sure that you stay connected on the latest you know, industry trends so that you stay current, right? Proactive skill development. 
This is one where, like I said before, what got you here will not get you there. I think as we got into the, the meeting here, you know, Doug asked who was looking for their next you know, opportunity, right? And what very much happens in your case, sir, is that as you're trying to explore different opportunities, these kind of things, you're often going to find you have to be proactive with developing that skill set. So what that does is it opens additional opportunities to come available to you in that regard, right? So the first one is C, continuous learning and developing skills. All right, we good? Yep. All right. I got to use these notes because there's a lot here. And I'm going to have my, you're going to see me do this back and forth with these glasses. These are bifocals and they're telling me, but uh, my wife tells me I need it. A, adaptability in the face of change. Okay. Really think about some of the things you're currently going through, what you may be experiencing, right? This is always talking about based on how technology changes at the way that it does, at the speed that it does. Let's be honest. Being in IT for us as professionals, this is a tough space to be in, right? We got impressing deadlines, unrealistic expectations set before us, and then just trying to keep up with the pace of what's happening you know, uh, out with technology itself. So you have to have the right mindset and growth when we start talking about this, right? And this is why the first step to doing this is you have to have a growth mindset, right? A lot of times folks will get into a situation, we get so focused on the problem itself, and it's like, I can't get past it, right? I think your slide was saying, hey, how am I staying up at night thinking about these things? I'm thinking about this one particular problem. You have to turn around and employ kind of a growth mindset to say, see that opportunity for what it is, or that challenge as for what it is, it's an opportunity to get better. Jocko Willink, he's a retired Navy SEAL, he's a motivated speaker. In one of his talks on YouTube, he takes any challenge that he faces, if he doesn't get it, he says, good. I didn't get the budget I wanted, good. I gotta build my strategy and go make a stronger approach. I didn't get the job promotion that I wanted, good. Time to get better, what skills I need to go after. So when you start thinking about that adaptability of change and how to have a growth mindset, that is a key way in which you go about in doing that. You've gotta take that in, you've gotta embrace that, right? If you don't, if you have a closed mindset, you're not gonna continue to progress in your career. For me, one of the reasons why I think I've been successful is, is oh, I can't even say successful, I got Garland and a couple others here, but I'm like, ah, you got some work to do, brother. <laughs> you know, so, but one of the things I think that's allowed me to, to progress through my career has been that growth mindset. Not being just stuck on a problem, but yes, how do we solve it, right? Let's take this opportunity, let's get better, let's move it forward, don't fixate on that. With this adaptability change, you also have to change your approach, right? So some of us grew up in the waterfall project days, right? Use that very sequential, lineal, those kind of things, right? In today's world, that doesn't work. You have to adapt to more of an agile type of approach. And you put it on your slide, we're all gonna do agile. I'll, you put that up, I laugh, it's like, damn it, he, saw, he knows what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but you have to change in your approach. You cannot keep that traditional way of doing things. Right? You need to adapt to more things that are flexible, breaking that work down into small chunks so that when that change happens, it's not where, oh my goodness, I gotta go back and change this whole project plan. I now have a smaller piece that I have to focus on. Right? And so put it in manageable pieces, but also change your approach. If you want to be more agile, don't be rigid. Have that growth mindset. Right? Don't be like, I've always done it this way, and you know, that's the biggest thing that starts a lot of conversations to me. We've always done it this way. Right, and the reaction is, okay, I need you out the room. Right, we need people to have a growth mindset. So that is A. Okay, C, A, coming into M. Manage stress and burnout. <sighs> Who in hell in this room is not stressed the hell out? <laughs> Show of hands. You're not stressed? No? I work in the Okay, okay, I'm gonna come back to you on that, right? So for the rest of us that are stressed, and trying to do that, that's okay, you need to write, I need to invest in you write a book. Um, <laughs> a lot of us, you think about, this is the one that I particularly struggle with a lot, right? And once again, you think about for, uh, those of us in the profession, the demands of the job, the workload, and these kind of things. Managing stress is one of those things that's really tough to do, right? But there are a couple ways you can go about trying to manage that stress. One is, and it took me a while to learn this, is actually learning to block off time on your calendar and prioritize the work. I don't know about you all, my days consist of from probably seven you know, in the morning to eight to eight, 8 p.m. at night, nothing but meetings. 
When do I get the work done? I don't. I wait while I do get it done. But it impacts my quality time, so my banter, right? And so you run into this, that perpetual cycle of doing that. You've got to learn how to block off time on your calendar. And it took one of my mentors at GE to tell me this. You need to block off time on your calendar to do the work so you don't do the work when it impacts on your family time, right? And those things, very big and insightful for me. Got it. Love it, okay? Realistic expectations. We've all been in situations where someone comes back and says, hey, I need this, I need it now. We in IT are traditionally people pleasers, right? We want to say yes to everything. Hey, I know you said you need a month to do this. You can get this to me next week, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Okay. Really? Right? So a lot of some of that pressure we put on, it's self-induced and it's self-inflicted. Sometimes we got to exercise that courage and push back and say, hey, set that expectation, right? But don't let it get to be unrealistic where you can't manage it and you can't do, do it. If you continue to find yourself in situations where you have that stress, you know, you are allowing it to fester. Therefore, that contributes to your burnout. So when I talk about personal resiliency, everything that I'm sharing with you all during the course of these seven things, these are things that you all, we all control, right, to get this back, you know, you know, under control, right? You do not have to live in that chaos. I didn't say that at the beginning. This is where you take control and manage what your world, your life looks like, right? A lot of what you were talking about earlier uh, in you know, his situation, his conversation, his pitch, to where you don't want to have those 15 questions come back to you and haunt you, okay? Promoting work-life balance. Oh, I'm really bad at this one. Right, so once again, talk about how do you manage that stress and that burnout. So, so what do you do? You said you're not stressed out, you know, you work really hard at it. Talk to us, what do you do? How do you yeah, manage so it? I do process improvement for healthcare and work with my team space on top of that. So uh, I do get stressed, um, personal and professional and everything else, but exactly what you just said, we have to block off the time and priority and figure out, is this really that important? And talk to the, uh, figure out what is actually causing that stress. I used to do risk management quality control as well. Can't sure. figure out the root cause. What is actually bugging me right now? Go address that. Just let it go. And I, I think a lot of times I talk to you and just breathe and let it go. Um, mm. Doesn't work all the time? No. But does it work most of the time? No. I've also okay. gotten really sick in my past from being stressed and I refuse to do that again. Ah, so nice. I won't let work stress me out anymore. Absolutely. And that's that point there is you don't let work control you run your day. Work is what you do, it's not who you are, right? And so, but this is why that piece about man managing that work-life balance is so important and how you go about that. Now, so for me, I'm bad at this. I don't do this well. I'm a workaholic by, by nature and trade. I'm just that way, and my wife has come to accept that. My son is the one who brought in a kink, a wrinkle in the kink, says, okay, I don't care what mom says, this ain't working for me. I need more of your time, right? Um, it actually works out for me to do this. My coping mechanism was saying the higher I went up in leadership, I said it's a lifestyle, right? I'm compensated to be this way. I'm always on call. I'm always on clock and all these things, right? But then when I talk to some of my, my mentors who were senior leaders, just like, hey, that's not right. I have a work-life balance. I'm able to draw that line between, <coughs> you know, work and then, you know, and personal. That was just a real, it's a struggle for me. It still is a struggle to, for this day. I'm glad you've kind of figured out how you've uh, processed and done things, and you're absolutely correct. A lot of times when that uh, stress comes in as well, we have a tendency to do the little small things first, and we take the big difficult things, we push them down the road, right, and we'll do them last, right? You gotta be disciplined enough to turn around and do a flip it to, to the front, okay? Got it, so that's M, so C-A-M. Talking about P, promoting self-care. Right, so this is all around the thoughts process of taking scheduled breaks, you know, doing exercise and doing stress relief activities, right? So I think there's an interesting statistic that says for an hour, you should probably spend 50 minutes at the stream and take 10 minutes to get up and go walk around, take a break, right? Anything beyond that point, it's just gonna, it's just, you're just spinning your wheels, right? And those kind of things, right? I will tell you, I've convinced myself I can go with the best of them, right? I can work through lunch, I can almost work through dinner. I don't need you know, drinks, right? I can go, 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 until eventually my body says, nah, wrong answer, try again, right? So, but you gotta get into the habit in order to promote that self-care. Make sure you're getting those scheduled breaks in in that regards. You have to do it. If you work on a team and your team is very supportive of each other, I would like to think that you've got team members that care about you, 
that was saying, hey, you know what, man? You've been hitting it, hitting the lick pretty hard. You know, you probably need to take some time off. As opposed to saying, hey, I need this by tomorrow. Can you have it for me? Right? So you got to schedule those breaks, right, in which you maintain uh, that time off. Incorporate physical activity. If anybody knows me, I'm a gym rat, right? You know, we were talking already, right? I'm an early riser. I'm up at the crack of dawn. You know, I turn around that Army commercial. I get more done before 8 a.m. for everybody else does. That's me, right? Because I'm up at 3.30, right? Oh, don't cringe. Don't run from it. No, I saw you. Don't run cringe from it, right? But, but understand there's a reason why I do that. For my time when I used to work at GE, I had a team in India. I would get up early, check on the team in India for an hour, then go to the gym and get my workout in. But you got to get your workout in, right? You, the comment, the slide, or the bullet on your slide is about health, right, and these kinds of things. No one's going to do that for you. You have to prioritize health, right? And so for me, I do it every day. I got a history of family health issues, so I got to work out or brothers going to die. Right, so I gotta turn around and do that to make sure that I survive, right? So, but you gotta turn your physical activity, your exercise, you gotta do that. That is a huge opportunity that returns around the effects and the benefits of exercise and get stressed. We know this, it works, right? You gotta prioritize your health and be your health first and foremost. No one's gonna do it for you, right? You know, and like you said, I think one of your slides made a comment too of, um, I wish I would have known my self-worth, right? No one says I ever wish I would have spent more time at work in these kind of things, right? Your health is your wealth. Your health is gonna allow you to live longer, your life to the full expectancy as possible. All right, and then stress relief, you know, techniques, right? So these are things such as meditation, you know, breathing exercises. Also as well too, do what makes you calm, what makes you relax you, right? Some folks like to listen to music, some people like to listen to books, gardening, taking walks, those kind of things, right? So these are some of the things that you need to do, once again, to promote self-care. You gotta do it. No one's gonna do that for you. I really mean that. Okay. That is P, so that's CAMP. So that makes sense, C-A-M-P. Consolidating, you know, continuous learning, skill development, adaptability to flex, uh, to change, um, managing stress and burnout, and then promoting self-care. So now we get to the other part. The BMC is just, it's all jacked up. I just, I tell you it is what it is, right? So the first one, B stands for building a supportive team culture, right? And this is kind of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. A couple ways you can do that, right? Uh, when you think about trying to navigate through this, you know, this stress or this technology tornado that you're in, you really got to have a really good team that's supportive and how you guys turn around and work together, right? And so there are a couple ways you can do that. There's talk, things about, about open and foster uh, uh, communi clear communications, team building activities, and then well-being centric, you know, um, subculture from this perspective. For me, within my organization, uh, I try to meet with all my direct reports. I, I do meet with them. I try to meet with their folks that support them. But in terms of trying to be very clear about what we're doing, you know, from a business standpoint, I talk about what the strategy is, where we're headed, what we're doing. I do this for a reason so the team understands where we're going and they can ask questions about that. By being clear in that communication and that direction, this is where hopefully they will understand you know, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. I think that once they understand that, it then goes to this concept of building a supportive you know, team culture from that perspective. <coughs> team building activities, you know, for example. And so when you have your team meetings, do you all conduct you know, team building activities, any icebreakers, those kind of things? Yeah, one head nod, yes, no, some, okay, you should, right? By doing these kind of things, you're breaking down that wall and providing folks an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. By forming that bond, that's how you start to improve that relationship, that communication gets better, and this is where you're now building that team supportive type of community that takes place. This is that culture that we're talking about, right? And then certainly that well-being culture, um, I will share with you and my team, we have that. But Yum takes that and makes that part of its culture. So here at Yum, we have Live Well Days. So in addition to the quarter, they'll add one day in on the calendar, and that is a Live Well Day. Okay? And from that perspective, I try to tell my team members, and I know they, they don't do it, and Garland, you may have some of this here in Nickelwoods too. I don't want to see any meetings on a Live Well Day. In fact, I don't even want to see you green on teams on Live Well Day. Now, the problem with that is they come back and reciprocate right back to me. So why is what are you doing? Right? Are you online looking for us? Don't worry about what I'm doing. Just worry about do you, do you, right? Do you. 
right, and those things. But you got to understand, you've got to uh, make sure you have that culture of well-being, and you have to look out for each other. I'm not saying the team has to be a family, and hey, we're thicker than you know, blood, and these kind of things, no. But life is tough in our professional careers and what we do, and so you have to have this thing about looking out for each other and just bonding. You've got to do it. No one person can do it by themselves, period. You can't. You can try it, good luck, but your health will suffer, your family will suffer, their life as a whole will suffer, right? So that is B. M, this is around mindfulness and emotional intelligence. And so has anyone been in a situation where, uh, whether within your team, with another department that had a lot of, you know, conflict and just tough conversations, right? Anyone have a good example in which how they use either mindfulness or emotional intelligence to work through a particular issue? No one. Come on. Everyone, you mean tell me, oh, I see you, Doug. You mean tell me everyone at, at work, everything is cool? No one's fighting, your IT's not fighting with finance over these kind of things. Infrastructure and cyber, Garland knows this. We're, we're, we're neck and neck, we're inverse proportional, all these things, right? Trying to work through some things. No one's got those challenges? I think you have to bring everybody on the table to resolve the Yep, no, absolutely. So this is where that mindfulness and emotional intelligence comes in, right? So the mindfulness is one being aware and then non-judgmental. And then the emotional intelligence, having that EI ability to know the situation, to read it, to how to engage, right? We can easily step into a conversation and throw a grenade into that room and just walk away and let it go, right? What good does that do to solve the problem, to relationships, and those kind of things? It doesn't work. And so, but you got to work on having that EI, you know, that helps you through that situation. Now, if you personally don't have it, you need to find someone before you go into that meeting, find someone who does, right? And that way they ensure that everything will move forward as peaceful, you know, as hopefully as it can be. But you also want to find yourself, develop that uh, EI ability so that when that conflict does arise, right, when you start to engage, and I'll use, you know, Garland, you know, so he is, you know, Garland's in our infrastructure group, I'm in cybersecurity. I've actually taken enough time to get to know him personally and know what he's trying to do with his role and these things in, in that regards, right? Garland's also got a chance to know me as well, also. But every time I step into a situation with Garland or anyone else's team, my mother told me, I got two ears, I got one mouth. I'm supposed to listen more than I talk. I always seek to understand first before I go in and start making decisions or forming an opinion on everything. Also as well too, some situations, I try to be the last person to talk. And you might have seen me in some calls. Someone asked a question, I'll be the first one chime is up. My feedback is don't be the first person to talk. Elias, stop, right? But you gotta use that emotional intelligence to be able to connect with people, but also once again, be mindful enough and aware enough to, like I said, always stop back, learn, listen first before you engage, right? All right, last and final one. Crisis preparedness and incident response. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Garland, you know where we were last year, January, about this time frame, right? I did. Okay. Uh, prepared. Were we prepared? <laughs> we were prepared. Close. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. Maybe All not right. quite enough. Okay, well, I'm glad you feel that way. I was, I was shaking my boots and everything. So last year around this time frame, our young had a ransomware incident, right? So this is where I've been through a couple cybersecurity incidents in my time, but nothing to that magnitude. And so when you're in this leadership position, this goes to stress we were talking about earlier, and then you are this, the senior security guy, right? You have this crisis response team, and everyone stands, and you was like, okay, all right, Elias, what are we going to do? Right now, I got a physics degree. I'm an independent thinker. 
I do my best thinking. I don't do well on my feet. You put me in a room, you solve a problem all day, I'll come back to you with the best answer. You put me in a lot of situations, hey, what are we gonna do for this kind of things? I got two left feet, but I'm stumbling and tripping over myself. But the thing that kind of helped when we had that incident was that we had an incident response plan. We had put one together and we had exercised it, right? And so because we had done that exercise when the actual incident happened, it wasn't so bad, right? Now, I was kind of like the duck. On above the water, I'm calm and cool. Folks, oh man, you handled that really well. And I said, well, you didn't see my legs under the water and you didn't see this tornado that was going on internally. But I knew we had a plan in which we were using to, to exercise to make that happen. So you got to have a, a plan, right? That plan is going to allow you in that stressful situation to be able to respond with a level of quickness and timeliness, right? And so if you think about, once again, this tech tornado, everything that we're dealing with, stuff happens all the time. There are cybersecurity incidents all the time. If I, I can't even come in and plan my day, I can try to plan my day. As soon as I get into the office or even before I get into the office, bam. Something's going on. What helps us get through that is we have a plan. The plan helps us do that. Continuous improvement for that plan, but also to um, risk mitigation preparedness. This is kind of what I was talking about as well also. Um, There's some companies that do those ER, those tabletops we were talking about, and I will share with you. You want to actually test those out, right? A lot of folks will say, hey, I have a DR plan. It's administrative. They check the box. Living through an incident and fighting that, that's not the time to start exercising that dog on DR plan, right? There are certain things you can do up front uh, that will help you reduce that, that, that risk, therefore that you can um, continue your plan uh, and not have a, a, a crazy reaction to it, right? So, but C, that final C is for that crisis preparedness and incident response. And so what I wanna do and, and tell in here is that what I've shared with you today, once again, I didn't bring anything to you that was earth shattering, anything you didn't do. No, right? But it is about you having that discipline to be able to exercise and practice these things. And then what I would do subsequently after this meeting is certainly be sure to share that with you all. But I would say just remember, you have the acronym that's called CAMP BMC, right? And so that's something you can use for that. And once again, I'm sorry I wasn't fancy and all foo like I said, I didn't do well at marketing, this is what it is. <laughs> But these are things that I hope, once again, as you go through and navigate and work in IT, IT is hard, right? No one can turn around and do what we do. But understand that chaos that you're dealing with, that technology tornado, this is why I put in that personal resilience. The way you work through that, that is clearly dependent upon each and every one of you, right? You don't let your life control you and all those kind of things, right? They say you can't control what happens to you, but you can't control how you respond to it, right? Those seven things I shared with you that can't be seen is what I hope will help you to navigate through that going forward. So, all right, thanks for your time. Thank you. Ryan, thank you. Elias, thank you. Uh, don't forget the March 14th competitive event, the, the uh, trivia, and that's a team sport. So build your team now, sign up for the event, I'll be sending you slides from this event and a follow-up email, so you'll get the information that you heard today, and the videos will be posted in a couple of weeks. The uh, audios go up just a few days after this event. Thank you so much. Remember to tell your friends uh, about this event so we can have great attendance like we did today. Have a great day.